Well, millions of people got up before daylight this morning and joined in a, what's called a sunrise service. Why? Because when Jesus rose from the dead, it changed history forever and ever. Changed everything. Now, the choir sang my text. Uh, I failed to talk about that from the baptistry. I should have told you that here is my sermon text today from the scriptures in Matthew 28 and verses 1 through 10. And they sang it be a lot more beautiful than I would ever be able to read it. Now, the rest of the story is, is that after he rose from the dead, he spent about 40 days walking on this earth doing some unusual things. He cooked, he ate with people, showed himself to 500 people at one time. During that course of time, it changed history to the point that it divided it in half. It divided it into two sections, B.C., before Christ, and A.D., which means in the year of our Lord. So when Jesus was born on this earth, uh, he forever changed history. So we are today at 2024, and we all date it back to the time of the Lord Jesus Christ. In that 40-day period, about 125,000 of the 250,000 that lived in Jerusalem received Jesus as their Lord and as their Savior and were gloriously transformed. You got to ask yourself, why is Easter so important? Well, it's important because it validated every claim that Jesus ever made about himself. He said, I'll tell you what, you destroy this body and in three days I will come back. He said that he was God in human form. He said he was the way, the truth, and the life, and nobody could ever get to God except through him. He said he was God in the flesh. Now, a lot of people claim to be God. There were many who claimed to be Messiah, still many who are claiming to be Messiah. But he is the only one that ever proved that he was the Messiah. In Luke chapter number one, in verse 78, the Bible says, because of the tender mercy of our God, with which the sunrise from on high will visit us to shine upon those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death. I hope that you'll stay in here with me for the next six or eight weeks uh, because I'm going to be preaching on the subject of mercy. This morning, I've entitled the message as well as the entire series, Good Morning, Mercy. I believe the Bible teaches that there are hundreds of times that we need God's mercy. I don't have time today to get through with all that I have prepared for today, much less do all hundreds of the times that we need mercy. But I do want to talk this morning for a few minutes about three of the times that occur in our life when we need God's mercy. Now, what does the word mercy mean. Mercy means that you are granted a forgiveness that you cannot buy, that you cannot earn, that you cannot work for, and you are given a love that you do not deserve. Mercy. Forgiveness you can't earn, love you don't deserve. Today, I want to talk about three times that you need his mercy. Number one, you ready? Shake your head like that, Pastor. I'm ready. Number one, we need mercy when we mess up, when we have done wrong. And that includes all of us. <laughs> that includes every one of us in this room. There is none righteous, no, not one. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's not any person that gets it right all of the time. There's not any person that does not need the mercy of God when we do wrong. I want you to take your Bible. Look over with me to one of my favorite chapters in the Bible. It's John, the Gospel of John and chapter number 8. Wonderful story. And if you would permit me, 
Let's begin reading uh, in that, oh, let's just do the second verse. John chapter 8, verse number 2. Early in the morning, he came again to the temple. And all the people came unto him, and he sat down and he taught them. So Jesus had a crowd of people, and he was teaching. And then in verse 3, the Bible says, The scribes and the Pharisees had caught a woman in the very act of adultery. Now I'm trying to figure out why in the world were they there to start with. Verse three says that uh, they set her in the midst of that huge crowd of people in the presence of the Lord Jesus. Verse four, they said, Master, this woman was caught in the very act of adultery and we wanna know what you say needs to be done with her. Verse five, the Bible says that uh, in the Ten Commandments, she's to be, well, in the commandments, she is to be taken outside the city gates and she is to be stoned. That's what Moses' law commands. But Jesus, what do you say about this? Hmm. This they said tempting him that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, well, if you don't have any sin in your life, if you've never done anything wrong, then you have the privilege of picking up the very first rock and hurling it right at her. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it being convicted by their own conscience went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even at the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man accused you or condemned you? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Now, powerful story, powerful illustration. And Jesus had this woman brought into his presence. And he says to the scribes and the Pharisees, if you've never done anything wrong, then you throw the rocks. And the fact of the matter is, they were no one qualified in that crowd to ever pick up the first rock and the per first stone. Nobody was qualified. We've all done wrong. We've done wrong with our words. We've done wrong with our actions. We've done wrong with our attitudes. We've done wrong with the places that we've gone. I wonder how many of you are sitting here today or watching my live stream this morning. Some of you are still in your pajamas and spring break and sitting by the pool and watching live stream in your church. Welcome. <laughs> how many of you still struggle with some stupid stuff that you do over and over again? I, I mean, there's a trap. She was caught in a trap. These Pharisees and scribes were trying to trap Jesus. How many of you are trapped in some habit that you can't break, some uh, method, some action, some attitude that you possess in your life that you really have problems with. Now, the question is not really how many of us have done it. We all have. We, there, nobody gets it right all of the time. The question is, now that you're caught, now that you're trapped, how does Jesus respond to that? He responds in the same fashion to us as he did to this woman who was caught in the very act of adultery. John 8 is recorded in all four of the Gospels. So it's obviously a powerful lesson for all of us to hear and to know. Well, here this woman is. I want you to watch how Jesus treated her with dignity, how that he treated her with compassion and not like the judgmentalism of those of the accusers. Now, notice how he treated this woman. He didn't approve of her sin. As a matter of fact, she was guilty. She was a cheater. Jesus knew that. But he says, uh, where are the accusers? Is anybody here to condemn you? And he said to her, neither do I condemn you. The word tells us that 
Jesus did not come into this world to condemn the world, but that the world through Jesus might be saved. And it's the same way that he does with us. Ladies and gentlemen, he does not condone what we do necessarily in our life, but he does love us. And he just simply said to this woman, that's not okay. What you did is not right. What you did was wrong. But now then, go and sin no more. Don't do it anymore. And he changed her life. And here's the issue of this whole lesson this morning. Um, You know what? When we cry out for the mercy of God, for the dumb things that we've done in our life, God doesn't condemn us. He doesn't condone our sin, but he forgives us and he sets us free uh, to live, to become who he wants us to be. He takes care of the guilt of our past and gives me the power to change, to be who he wants me to be in the future. But that's a problem with so many people, maybe that are even here this morning. You are so bound up by the wickedness of your past You are bound up and enslaved by the dumb things that you've done in your history that you can't move forward. You are stymied right now and you cannot go and take that next step into your future because you are so bound up in your past. But when Jesus comes on and he forgives you and he sets you free, then you enabled to have the power that only he can give you to become who he wants you to be. He said to her, I don't condemn you. Go and sin no more. Jesus quotes Isaiah 61. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted and to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from the darkness for the prisoners. I wonder how many of you are locked down. How many of you are enslaved? How many of you are faced with a life of regret and you can't forgive yourself for some of the things that you've done? Or maybe you have so much resentment built up in your life because of what somebody else has done to you to hurt you and the bitterness is overwhelming you. Maybe some of you are here this morning and you're in a prison of worry and fret and anxiousness. You're so worried about things in life that you literally have become physically sick. How many of you are filled with some kind of secret sin or bad habit or some addictive behavior in your life that you cannot be who God wants you to be until that's dealt with? John chapter 12, verse 47, Jesus said, I didn't come to judge the world, but I came to save it. James tells us that mercy triumphs over judgment. My encouragement to all of you here this morning is to accept the mercy of God today. Receive his mercy now. And it means that you're going to get what you really don't deserve. When I look out and I see the sea of faces that's sitting before me and I think about people that I've known for so many years. I see people that have been radically changed by the power of God. But I wonder how many of you are still living a life of shame. How many are facing something that you are ashamed of? Just look at how God responds to how you've messed up. He extends his mercy. And he says, I don't condemn you. I don't condone what you're doing either. But I don't condemn you. Just don't go do it anymore. Let me change your life. Number two, another time that you're going to need the mercy of God is when you are weighed down by disappointment. When disappointment weighs you down. I wonder, anyone here sitting right now, every need of your life, has totally been met. You don't have a need one in your life. You understand that unmet needs in our life 
really cause a level of frustration to mount up on us that if we're not careful, we wind up being extremely angry about it. And we face things in our life with that anger, with that frustration that ultimately leads us to live a life of total disappointment. Now, you, you just have to understand something. I don't have it. You don't have it. You don't have what it takes to meet every need that comes on in your life. There are going to be some needs arise in your life that only God can meet. Turn with me to the book of John chapter number five. Just a few pages back. John chapter number five. Notice, begin reading with me in verse two. There, there, there's a, at Jerusalem by the sheep market, a pool. It, it literally translates, there's a sheep gate. There are all kinds of gates that were leading inside to the city of Jerusalem and they all had a name and this particular gate is called the sheep gate. Want to make a stab at what, why it's called the sheep gate? It's because sheep go through that gate. And inside there, there was the pool of Bethesda. Kathy and I were there a few months ago and they had just made some major discoveries around that pool that back up exactly what the Bible has been talking about. So here was this pool of Bethesda and there lay a great multitude of impotent folk, a blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water for an angel went down at a certain season into the pool once a year and troubled the water. Whoever then was the first one into the troubled water. They came out healed of every disease that they had. Well, there was a man there that had been there for 38 years, according to verse 5. Jesus saw him lie and knew that he'd been now a long time in that case. He said to him, do you want to be healed? Do you want to be whole? The impotent man answered him, sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool. But while I'm coming, another steps down before me. Jesus said unto him, rise, take up your bed and walk. And immediately the man was made whole and took up his bed and walked. And on the same day was the Sabbath. And here was an old boy that was lying there at the pool for 38 years. For 38 years, he couldn't wait for that water to be troubled by the angel. So the possibility of him getting down into that water so that he could be healed of every malady he had. But for 38 different times, every time the water was troubled, he would seek to get in there. But before he could get in there, somebody else got in there before him. And they got healed and he didn't. And for 38 years, <laughs> he was frustrated angry. Needs went unmet. Let me ask you what you've been waiting on in your life. What need do you have in your life right now that has gone unmet and it's been going on for a very long time? And maybe you're just like this old boy. You're waiting on somebody else to help meet that need in your life and nobody else has come through for you. Nobody else has been able to meet it. Some of you may be like the person who said, you know, if I can just get married, man, if I can just find the right husband, if I can just find the right wife, I believe that every need in my life is going to be met. And about 10 minutes after you said I do, you thought, hmm, that didn't work out so well for me. Hmm? And now then you just realize that that need in my life has gone unmet all of these years and you're just settled into the fact that I'm never going to have this area of my life need met ever. And you're living disappointed and you're living hurt because you thought your mate could somehow meet that need in your life. And he was waiting, he was frustrated because he had been putting his faith in everything else except where it should have been placed, and that was in God. And my friend, let me just tell you, that's the way it's always going to be in your life. When you're waiting on something and someone to meet the need in your life, 
and it goes unmet all of this time, you're going to wind up frustrated, angry, and disappointed because there are some needs that only God can meet. Nobody else will be able to meet that need in your life. Can you imagine how this old boy must have felt? Here he is by the pool of Bethesda, had been there for 38 years. He's missed out on over half of his life waiting on somebody else to meet his need for him. What is the secret disappointment in your life? You say, well, honestly, pastor, it's not my marriage. I'm more disappointed in me right now than anything else. I thought by now I would have been a whole lot further down the road with what I thought my life was going to look like than what I am right now. The trajectory of my life has not reached the potential that I thought that it would have. And I'm more disappointed in me than I am anybody. Maybe some of you parents are sitting here and you're really disappointed in how your kids have turned out. Maybe you professional people thought my career would be a lot better off than it is right now. And you're disappointed in your professional life. Well, how did Jesus respond to this old boy? Because it'll be the same way that he responds to you. Notice with me, if you will, at verse six. He looks at the guy and he asks him this question. Do you want to be healed? Now, you know, I'm trying to put myself in this guy's spot. I've been lying there for 38 years waiting on this to happen. And here comes a teacher. And he looks at me knowing that I've been here all of this time. And he asked me the question, do I want to be healed? Well, don't you think it's a little obvious that I do want to be healed? Duh. Do you think I'd be coming here every day of my life for 38 years, hanging out with this decrepit bunch of people if I didn't want to get healed? The answer's kind of obvious, isn't it? Well, there's a lot of sick people that say that they want to be well. There's a lot of sick people that say they want to be healed. There are a lot of sick people that say that they want life to be different until they look at the fact that something has to change if I'm going to be healed. And change can be scary. Change can run people off. Change can pe keep people turned Away. I can't tell you the numbers of people that have come to me down through the course of my ministry and, and, and say, you know what, Pastor, I, I want some relationships to be healed. I, I want things to be different around me. Th this has got to change. I want my relationship with people. I want my relationship uh, with God. It's unhealthy. I'm sick and I want it to be better. And then I'll look at them and I'll say, well, why don't you just change? Why don't you just be different? Why don't you quit doing some of this stuff and start doing some of this stuff? And they realize the cost of what they're asking and they don't want to pay that cost. They don't want to change. Can I just tell you, you can't change other people. But you can change yourself and you can give other people somebody different to react to. You can change a relationship, but it begins with you. I say that to other people, you know, just fix your issues, fix your problems, fix what you're doing. And, and, and you know what? First thing they start doing is making excuses and start rationalizing and they start blaming other people. This old boy said, well, you know, I, I'd like to get down in that water, but if somebody else would just help me blaming somebody else. And he says, you know, when that water's troubled, somebody else gets down in there before I do. And he had resentment built up for them getting healed. I wonder, do you have resentment over somebody else's successes rather than yours? Somebody got a diamond ring, they got engaged and you haven't. Hadn't come along for you just yet. They get married and you can't rejoice with them because it's not your wedding day. They get pregnant and you didn't because you've been trying to have kids for all these years and you can't. Somebody else gets pregnant and you can't rejoice with them because you let resentment because it's not you. Somebody else gets that promotion at work 
And you said, that promotion should have been mine. I deserved it more than them. You can't rejoice with them because you got resentment. Somebody else gets in the water before I do. They wind up just being extremely unhappy. Are you unhappy today? You know that happiness is a choice. You choose to be happy or you choose to be unhappy. Some of the happiest people I've ever been around in my life was in a cardboard house and a dirt floor and I'm eating a, 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 a chicken leg that was just a little while before that running around my feet. And the people that I was enjoying that meal with were the happiest people that I've ever met in my life. Why? Because they chose to be happy. Verse number eight, Jesus said to him, rise and take up your bed and walk. The very minute that this old boy decided to place his faith and his trust in Jesus is the very minute that the impossible became possible. The very minute that you quit blaming other people for the plight that you are in life. The very minute that you place your faith and your trust in Jesus will be the very minute that those impossibilities that you face in your life will become a reality. They'll become possible. I, now, there's some things about this story I really don't understand. I, I want to stop right here because if you go back to what we read a few minutes ago, the Bible says there's a multitude of people around there. Huh? He wasn't the only one that needed healing. Can I get an amen? All right. He, he, there's a whole bunch of other people. But he was the only one that was healed. What, what's, what's up with that? Why is it that some people are healed and some people are not? I, I don't know. I don't have the answer to that. I know that this, you and I are still here on earth and we're not in heaven. And the perfect will of God being accomplished in heaven, he says, I want you to pray that. I want you to pray, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. A lot of this stuff we just don't understand. I don't understand how that there can be uh, an old boy driving on I-85 and a drunk driver comes across the median and hits him head on and kills him. And I listen to people say, well, it must have been the will of God. No, it wasn't. No, it wasn't. That's a bunch of hooey. It's not so. You say, well, why doesn't God remove all of evil? Well, if God removed all of evil and he'd go, poof, all of a sudden, planet Earth would be vacated by everybody on it because we're the cause, we're the problem. If God removed all of the evil in the world, then he would have to eliminate man's free moral choice of life itself because it's the choices that we make that produce the evil in the world. I don't want to be a robot. One of these days we'll understand. One of these days when we get to heaven, I just know this, that God takes the impossibilities of our life and he makes them possible. Number three, we need God's mercy when death is on its way. We need God's mercy when death is on its way. This is going to sound harsh, and I don't mean for it to. God knows my heart. Only a fool goes through this life unprepared for the inevitability of death. Death is inevitable and it's unpredictable. It's going to happen. We just don't know when. Now, I want you to know I'm not afraid to die. Not looking forward to the process, but I'm not afraid to die. Just a few days ago, I visited in a home of Miss Frances Fowler. Miss Frances looked up with this huge smile on her face and she said, oh, pastor, I'm just looking so forward to heaven. 
I'm, I'm looking forward to dying. I'm not, a, not one bit of fear do I have, preacher. I, I'm ready to die. Matter of fact, I wish I could die right now. Never met anybody quite like Miss Francis Fowler. But the fact of the matter is, there's some of you that are sitting here this morning scared to death of dying. As a matter of fact, you don't even like to hear me talking about it, much less you talking about it. Turn over with me to Luke chapter 23 for just a minute. Luke chapter 23. And I want you to see verse 39. Luke chapter 23. And notice with me, if you will, verse 39. And one of the male factors which were hanged railed on him saying, If you're Christ, save yourself and us. But the other answering rebuked him saying, Does not thou fear God? seeing you're in the same condition, condemnation. And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man has done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come to your kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto you, today you'll be with me in paradise. Today. Now, we don't know a whole lot about these two thieves. The Bible doesn't tell us. But Jesus is being crucified with a thief on either side of him. And one of the thieves looks over at him and says, well, if you're really who you say you are, if you're really the Messiah, if you're really the King of Kings, then save yourself and take us with you. Mm. The other thief heard him and he said, Man, you don't know what you're talking about. This, old, this man has done absolutely nothing deserving of this kind of treatment. You and I are getting what we deserve, but he's done nothing. Now, if you do a word study on that little word, nothing, it literally means nada. This man's done zero. He's done nothing to deserve the treatment that he is getting. You know, a lot of people mock and blaspheme God because they don't believe that there's any life after death. They believe that death is the final of all of life itself. And you say, well, preacher, why do you and how do you believe uh, that there's life after death? Well, I'm betting everything in my life on the fact that Jesus Christ is not a liar, that he is who he says that he is. And what are you going to do when you get to death itself and all of a sudden you discover that there are no do-overs. You discover that there are no mulligans and that life does go on after death. And you then at that point can't say, oh my, I was wrong. Let me go back and let me redo this thing. Won't be any redos. There's going to come a day that you won't be able to run away from God anymore. There's going to come a day that you won't be able to ignore God anymore. There's coming a day, even though you don't want to face him now, there's going to come a day that you're going to be face to face with God at the great white throne judgment where everything that you've ever done is going to be revealed and judged. You may ignore him now, but one day you won't. As a matter of fact, you need to understand that there's a whole lot more time on the other side of death than there is here. You may live 50, 60, 80, maybe some of you, 100 years on this side of death, but you're going to live forever somewhere on the other side of death. We deserve to die, he says, but this man has done nothing. Have you ever met anybody that you could say that about? No, it can only be said about Jesus, the only perfect, sinless man who's ever lived that qualified him to be the sacrificial sin, sacrificial uh, uh, lamb of God for you and for me because of that sinlessness that he possessed. So this guy looks over at Jesus and he says, 
remember me. Two words. That's all it was. Now y'all have heard me preach numerous times and at the close of most services, not all, but the close of most of them, I lead people in what's called a sinner's prayer. And if you're not careful, you'll begin to think and believe that you have to say certain words in a certain formula in order for God to hear you and to save you, but that's not so. Remember me. He didn't say, by the way, can I just tell you, these boys knew who Jesus uh, was and what he had done. They, they, they had seen and heard of his miracles. This boy was not oblivious to the fact that Jesus had raised the dead, that he had healed the sick, that he had performed miracle after miracle, but he wasn't asking Jesus to take him down off of that cross and get him out of his pain and out of his misery. He said to the Lord Jesus, something that every one of us need at some point in life is to understand that the greatest need for mercy that we will ever have is to be forgiven of our sin, that one day we're going to die and have to stand before God and we need forgiveness. And so he said, Remember me. Jesus said, that's good enough. That's good enough. Then heaven is yours. Just like Peter when he was about to drown, he said, Lord, save me. Immediately, he saved me. And the Bible says, Jesus said today. This is good enough today. You'll be with me in paradise and I'll see you in heaven. You say, well, that's a powerful last minute conversion experience. That's a deathbed experience. That's what I'm going to do. Sometime before I die, I'm going to give my life to Jesus. I'm going to ask him to forgive me. I'm going to ask him to come into my heart. I'm going to get heaven ready before I die. Okay. When are you going to die? Well, silly, nobody knows that. Exactly. You plan to get saved next Thursday, but on Wednesday you meet a semi-truck head on. You won't be able to say, well, I was going to get saved tomorrow. Doesn't work that way. What happens when you accept the mercy of God? You get to the point in your life that you get real transparent with God. God, I need your forgiveness. I've lived dumb. I've lived stupid. I've lived apart from you and I've run from you. But God, today, I just need your mercy. I just need your forgiveness. Maybe some of you are here today. You're facing impossible things in your life. You have major needs that have gone unmet. Why not today realize and recognize somebody else is never going to be able to meet that need in your life and quit blaming circumstances and situations for the fact that you have these unmet needs in your life and just simply throw yourself on the mercy of God and say, you know what, God, I can't do anything about this. This is impossible. Aren't you glad God makes the impossible possible? With men, things are impossible, but with all things, it's possible with God. Some of you are like the thief on the cross. You don't need God to meet needs in your life. You don't need him to fix relationships. You need him to fix you. And you're not ready to die. You're afraid to die. You don't want to talk about death. Listen to the scripture. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he dies, yet shall he live again. The word says in Acts chapter 2 and verse 21. I love this. And it begins with whoever. I love that word. That means you. It means no matter what kind of background that you have, doesn't matter what lifestyle that you've lived in the past, it doesn't matter how wicked and evil and sinful you've been 
and in shame and in guilt. It doesn't matter. He says, whoever asks for mercy from the Lord shall have it and shall be refreshed. One final passage of scripture in Isaiah. The Lord is waiting to show you how kind he is and to have mercy on you. The Lord always does what is right and he blesses those who trust in him. As quietly and as reverently as you possibly can, would you stand with me for just a minute, please? Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Father, I can't fix anybody. I couldn't, matter of fact, couldn't even fix me. Lord, you had to do that for me. God, I suspect that there's a ton of people right now under the sound of my voice. Lord, they need to be fixed. Lord, we all need your mercy. Some people need mercy here for just some things that they've done wrong. Words that they've said. Things that they've done, places they've gone. Attitudes that they have projected. God help them right now to cry out for mercy. Lord, you said that you would forgive and you would cleanse. And then you tell them, just don't go do it anymore. Stop it. I'm not going to condemn you. Just don't do it anymore. Let me change you. God, would you change people? Thank you for watching Decision for Life. Our location, life group, and program information are available online at fpcit.org. We hope you will take the opportunity to join us in person. Thank you from the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail.